I guess we have the retro music still on. All right, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the first uh, Progen Town Hall meeting. And uh, it's really good to kind of have uh, everyone uh, here. We also have uh, many of the people who have been very instrumental in making Progen happen right from the initial uh, uh, conception to all you participants who help build this community. Uh, irrespective of um, what time zone are you are, it's a good morning, good afternoon, good evening for you. Please do in the chat, uh, do mention where you are for, from so that we know the broad diversity of the participants we have. For example, I will say, hi, I am Mohanti. I am from, I'm originally from India, but for now I'm in Geneva. Geneva. That helps us get a good sense of where all of us are. And in the meantime, I'll say, uh, I am uh, Mohanti. I'm the CEO and co-founder of uh, AI Crowd. And uh, AI Crowd uh, was a small academic project that used to be called as Crowd AI that I started during my uh, PhD at EPFL, uh, where uh, my whole idea was around bringing together a lot of people who are interested in open research. And the idea was any research paper that I write should be open and accessible to uh, anyone. And also, if you have a better solution than me, then uh, you should be able to submit your code and we figure out uh, how we can have a lot of open solutions to the same problem. Uh, along the way, I met, I was very fortunate to meet a lot of great researchers and a lot of uh, industry partners who came in together. And uh, we had a lot of really interesting problems on uh, AI Crowd. And I have ever, always been ever so more passionate about um, RL uh, benchmarks in general and a lot more around reinforcement learning because I have a little of a, a bit of a soft corner towards uh, uh, reinforcement uh, learning. And uh, I've been involved in uh, quite a few of these uh, reinforcement learning benchmarks uh, starting in 2017 when I remember we put together this learning to uh, run, learning to walk, learning to run uh, benchmark at NeurIPS. And then back then also everyone was like, okay, this is crazy, this too had a problem. But it took like uh, about six months before many researchers from all around the world who are not our traditional NeurIPS ICM researchers who came together to with so many clever solutions to these problems that we ourselves were overwhelmed by the solutions. And that gave us the motivation to keep doing this a lot more. Uh, over the years, we have uh, worked on a whole variety of problems, again, uh, from uh, also at NeurIPS, and NeurIPS has been exceptionally kind to us in promoting many of the research uh, benchmarks that we basically do. And then PropGen is also one of those stories which actually started at uh, NeurIPS, where uh, at Vancouver um, last year, uh, we were um, around and then someone, uh, uh, yeah, I think I had uh, just came through the PropGen paper and then I ran into Carl from OpenAI, who was the first author of the PropGen uh, paper. And then we started discussing like the broad idea, okay, why they wanted to put together um, uh, PropGen, their initial uh, experiments with PropGen and whatnot. Then I mentioned that I'm a little bit passionate about RL benchmarks. And then we started discussing. And then across these discussions, uh, we basically said right now, pretty much in the first meeting, let's make this happen. And uh, while NeurIPS, if any of many of you probably have been there, so you know that it is uh, quite intense, but we were kind of a little bit responsible enough to follow off um, on this crazy plan that let's put together this benchmark where uh, hundreds and thousands of people can potentially submit their uh, solutions and we evaluated in all the progen environments. Now, in the beginning, we had no clue how we will make this happen. Of course, we had, uh, you know, the whole evaluation setup from AI code, which would work, but we had to convince a lot of other people to come and help make this happen, right? On what is the design of the competition? How is the design relevant from a research point of view? Uh, how can we actually find the compute and uh, so on and so forth. There were like many open questions, but across uh, all these few months that we have been working so hard in making this happen, it has been a great experience. It has been a great ex learning experience for us that something like this is possible and something like this, uh, more uh, examples like these need to exist. Because again, another thing that we also have in our academic circles that it's a um, small bunch of researchers who many of us are kind of quite privileged where we somehow end up in the right um, academic circles and we um, are kind of projected into the right um, uh, research circles to be able to kind of work on many of these problems. While in context of my journey with AI Crowd, I have seen hundreds and thousands of really inspiring people all around the world who would have never considered a career in research or even doing research. They saw a fun pro problem, they came in and they helped us with it. In the process, we, we were like, wow, as in these guys have really cool ideas and much of the work is how do we engage so many of these researchers who are out there who are not in our traditional research circles to come and 
join us in this open research initiative. So open research initiative is something that we have been trying to do. Uh, we will be trying to do a lot more where many of the research that we are doing in house, we will open it up for others to kind of come in and uh, contribute. And Procgen is again, one of those initial um, uh, such uh, experiments uh, along with Flatland. Uh, I hope uh, maybe some of you are also participating uh, in uh, Flatland. If not, I would uh, encourage you to go and check it out. And uh, for now, without taking much more time, I would actually invite Carl to come in, Carl from OpenAI, who is one of the lead researchers behind Procgen. And I will let him to jump in and tell us the whole story of Procgen, how it came about being. And then we can go to discuss how, how from this initial Procgen paper, we came up with this idea of having this benchmark, the competition design, so on and so forth. Khan, are you around? Uh, yeah, I'm here um, trying to share video right now. Um, it's a Cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. So hopefully we can figure that out. Prashant, you'll have to figure that out. Yeah, but all good meetings start with a little bit of technical difficulties. So that's uh, perfectly fine. And while Cal, uh, um, uh, Cal and Rushank uh, sort out and how Cal can have the video and the screen shared, I see Florian is already doing some little bit of uh, flatland promotion. Uh, Florian is uh, also one of the researchers from our team. And I co-lead the um, uh, flatland challenge with him uh, at NeurIPS. And he has posted some links there. And we see we have a lot of people here uh, on this webinar. We have Deepam from Kolkata, Florian from Switzerland. We have Kim from Korea, Sneha Hyderabad, Kwang uh, DC, Sahika, who is also one of the speakers. Uh, she's uh, currently in uh, Seattle, Washington, originally from Turkey. Mohit from Coimbatore. Okay. Or, um, I guess we have yeah, think, difficulty sorting. Uh, sort perhaps working now. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Cool. I'll hand it over to you, Carl. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Mahanti. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Carl. I, uh, I'm part of the reinforcement learning team at OpenAI, and uh, me and my teammates have uh, yeah, spent a lot of time thinking about uh, generalization in deep RL, and that's sort of what led us to design Procgen Benchmark here. So I'm going to um, spend a lot of this talk kind of talking about um, some of the history that, that went into us designing this benchmark, um, like, like the motivation that uh, brought us here, and uh, yeah, um, this has been a very important question for our team for a while now. So. Um, I'm very, very excited that uh, you know we've been able to turn this into a competition and that we're getting um, all you to participate. It's um, really wonderful. Uh, so yeah, one of the biggest issues in deep RL as I've seen it often is that many um, common benchmarks use really the same environments for both training and testing. You know whether this is something like the arcade learning environment where you have these uh, you know games like Pong, Ms. Pac-Man. You know you you get. Um, it's great to have you know, a diverse number of environments included in the benchmark, but if each an individual environment is really constantly showing the agent the same states, then you have this, um, you know, you're concerned about whether or not uh, your agents are really learning robust skills or whether they're just like memorizing how to do one thing very well and then not really knowing anything else aside from that. Um, and this concern about overfitting is what, uh, yeah, what, what, what led us to want to design Proxy and Benchmark. Um, Proxen Benchmark has, uh, you know, as you all know, has these 16 different environments. And um, thanks to the procedural level generation, you know, we can generate as many levels as we need. And so we're really sure that when the agents do learn something in these environments, because there's such a high level of diversity, you know, they really are learning to generalize, at least within this, you know, broad um, environment distribution. Obviously, you know, you're not just going to generalize from one game to another, but at least within like the set of all possible levels, you're learning relatively uh, general and robust skills. And, um, and that, you know, that's kind of a more interesting um, problem to tackle than, you know, how to just like uh, have an, teach an RL agent to like follow one particular path through a maze or something like that. Um, so th throughout this uh, talk, I'll, I'll, I'll begin by talking about some of our previous uh, generalization benchmarks that we came up with, some of our like original thoughts and, you know, what was successful and what wasn't. I'll then, um, you know, segue into talking more specifically about Procgen and the design principles we followed when creating each of these environments. And then um, towards the end, I'll talk about some of our initial experimental results, which may be familiar to some of you if you've um, read our papers on Coin Run and, and Procgen. So one of the, uh, the one of the earlier projects that my team worked on at OpenAI was this um, benchmark and generalization using Sonic the Hedgehog. So we collected a bunch of levels. Um, and uh, we got like 58 in all, and we divided them into 47 training levels and 11 test levels. 
and the idea here was to see, you know, how well can agents generalize from these 47 training levels to these unseen test levels. And we actually ran a competition um, using this benchmark, uh, but we found that it was really unintentionally uh, challenging. Like we, we knew it'd be hard, but we uh, it sort of ended up underestimating just how hard this task was. Because what we kept finding time and again is that, you know, no matter how we trained, we ended up with agents that were very good on the 47 training levels, but really didn't do anything at all significant on the 11 test levels, aside from maybe, you know, just encoding some notion that like the agent wants to move to the right of the screen. Um, but there's really no robustness at all. And, uh, you know, we, no, no matter what methods we tried, we just didn't get a very great signal with this benchmark. And uh, e even the, the competition participants, the ideas that were most successful were really just um, like hyperparameter tweaks on existing algorithms or hard coding certain inductive biases into, um, into the agents. And, and these things were useful at, you know, on this particular benchmark, but aren't really more general methods that are, are going to apply in other settings. Um, and so after, you know, playing around with this benchmark for a while, we started to wonder, you know, maybe just 47 training levels really isn't enough. You know, our algorithms just aren't, aren't, aren't good enough at this point, and so we need to, you know, kind of consider a different setting. And that's what really led us um, towards procedural generation, because obviously with procedural generation, you can generate as many levels as you need. Um, and that's a huge advantage. So Coin Run was the first game that we um, created, and uh, since it was the first one, that was the one we decided to use for the warm-up round of this competition. It's also the environment that we sort of have the most experience with ourselves. We've run, I've personally run a whole lot of experiments on coin run. So, you know, very familiar with all its quirks. Um, and I think, I think it's, you know, a, a, a very useful environment to start with. Um, for anyone who's not familiar, you know, the general idea in this game is to just collect the coin that lies in the far right of the level. And along the way, you have to navigate across obstacles, enemies, you know, and if you touch these things, you, you, the episode instantly ends and, um, you know, you don't get any reward. Uh, one, one of the other things that's true about um, Coin Run is that there's, you know, and this is really true for all the Prop Gen games, is that there's high variance in difficulty um, across the levels. And this is actually very important to provide a um, curriculum for the agent. Otherwise, um, the agent isn't going to be able to have, like, a, uh, isn't ever going to be able to learn how to solve the hardest levels if it doesn't have some nice scaffolding of, like, you know, really easy and medium levels to help it get there. So the two levels are shown here. The level on the left is obviously quite easy, and the level on the right is uh, much harder. And if we were only to train on those levels on the right, then really the agent would just have a very hard exploration challenge. It wouldn't get anywhere, and we wouldn't really have anywhere near as good of a signal um, than it, when we train on the whole distribution. So one of the first things we wanted to answer in Coin Run, you know, kind of coming off our Sonic experiment, was just, OK, how many training levels do we need here to, in order to be able to see good generalization? Um, so we trained them, um, training sets a bunch of different sizes from 100 training levels on the low end up to um, many tens of thousands on the high end. And the training performance here is shown in blue and the test performance is shown in red. So what we see is that, you know, with small number of levels like 100, training performance is great and test performance is terrible. There's this large um, generalization gap. And then by the time we get up to like, you know, 10,000 or more levels, the training and test performance match the generalization gap is closed. Um, and this was really a very surprising result to us initially. You know, we knew that quite a few levels would be necessary, but we really didn't expect that it would take, you know, 10,000 levels of such a relatively simple game to train the agent to perform well. You know, and so then when you consider this in the context of our earlier Sonic benchmark, it's like, well, really, gosh, 47 training levels to Sonic was basically nothing at all. You know, we're not even, we're not even on the coin run graph here with, when just considering 47 levels. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting question to ask, like, how many levels would be necessary from Sonic in order for the agent to just generalize to a level it's never seen before? And, you know, following these results, the answer is probably quite, quite a bit. Like, um, yeah, you know, at least 10,000, right? Um, and so Sonic's substantially more complicated than Coin Run. Another, another one of the really interesting experiments we found early on in Coin Run is that uh, these, this uh, larger, deeper in, um, in policy and in architecture generalizes much better than our um, previous default, which we call this nature CNN architecture, um, which just has three convolutional layers. So the Impala one's um, you know, ResNet architecture, and the nature one is just this, um, this small CNN um, that was originally used in the uh, uh, nature Atari paper. And um, here we see that basically the Impala, the deeper architecture is just uh, much better at generalizing, you know, acro across the boards. For any given size of training set, you're going to get much better test performance if you're using this um, resonant architecture. 
And so it's these results that really led us to use um, the Impala ResNet as the default architecture in the, uh, in the current starter code for the production competition. So yeah, we you know we were really excited with Coin Run and our initial result, um, results we got there. But uh, there's an obvious drawback to using Coin Run as a RL benchmark, and that's that it's still only one single environment. You know, we, we don't want to overfit to the peculiarities of Coin Run. At least with a benchmark like the arcade learning environment, you know, you have these 60 Atari environments, and so at the very least, you have many different environments contributing to the overall signal. And so what we what we really wanted to see was. Uh, you know, the best of both worlds, something where we have, you know, high diversity within every individual environment, but also, you know, diversity across the benchmark as a whole. And so that's what led us um, to design ProcGen Benchmark. And, you know, we, we weren't able to design, you know, 60 games to match Atari, but we have 16. And we think that um, this gives us, you know, quite a um, broad distribution um, of environments that provides a useful benchmark. Um, I'm going to skip over this uh, for reasons of time. So I'll just jump right into talking about uh, the design principles we followed in each one of these games. Uh, the, the most important thing to us always was just having very high diversity, both within the individual environments as well as across the benchmark as a whole. And having this high diversity really ensures that the agents are encountering meaningful generalization challenges in each one of these individual environments. As for the games themselves, we roughly strove to mimic the style of Atari and Jim Retro games. Which is to say, you know, we often use platformers or shooter games or things like that. Um, all the games are, uh, you know, conceptually very simple. And really, in order for the agent to succeed, it just has to identify a few critical assets in the observation space and enact the appropriate low-level mode responses. We also optimize these environments to be very fast. You know, can perform thousands of steps per second on a single CPU core, and this makes experimenting with them much easier. All the environments have um, two difficulty settings. The in, um, results from the paper originally reported on the hard difficulty setting, but in this competition, we're using the easy difficulty setting since uh, that makes the, you know, the compute requirements much more manageable. In all the environments, we try and make all the levels solvable, but you know, it's not strictly guaranteed to be the case. Uh, you know, there are likely to be some very small edge cases that occur very infrequently that might lead to unsolvable levels. And then as you know, probably most of you know, um, all the environments use shared action observation spaces, which really just makes uh, the overall experimental pipeline easier to work with. Um, so we'll, uh, I'll, I'll just show briefly some experimental results here. Um, here's generalization curves on all the different uh, ProcGen environments. We can see kind of a very similar trend emerge as before, as we saw in Coin Run, um, where there's overfitting that occurs, you know, really up to generally around 10,000 levels in most of these environments. It obviously varies by environment. Some games are a little bit harder for the agent to generalize on. But um, pretty much in all environments, we need you know quite a few levels, and we thought this is you know just again kind of very surprising, um, interesting thing to note that across all these different games, you know we we see um, the, the agents really struggle to generalize from a small finite set of levels. Um, another really interesting ablation study we did with um, ProcGen was to train on a deterministic sequence of levels. Um, so, you know, this kind of simulates standard video game settings where you start in level one, then if you succeed, you go to level two, then level three. Um, and then if the agent dies, then it just, uh, the episode terminates, and then, it, you know, the next episode starts at level one. And that's the training performance here, shown in blue. And then at test time, shown in orange, instead of doing a fixed sequence of levels, we just randomize the sequence entirely. So it starts at a random level and then transitions to random levels each time. And what this shows us is that, you know, when you have this fixed sequence, you're getting this very narrow path through the state space. And so you're, uh, you know, you, you appear to have good training performance. I mean, you do have good training performance, but um, really you're not, uh, you can see from the curves in orange that you're, we're not generalizing at all, you know, and we haven't really learned anything useful about the underlying distribution of levels when we just train on this very narrow path of experience. Um, and it, I think that this sort of, these sort of results here have very important implications for, you know, what do we want to see in a benchmark in general? You know, if, if our benchmark was just to um, uh, evaluate the training performance here, then we would, we would, you know, things that might work very well in this overfitting regime, um, you know, are going to be very different, might not work at all when we're really focused on generalization. Um, and ProcGen sort of implicitly focuses on generalization, even when you're not measuring it explicitly, because the overall distribution is just so diverse. Um, and, you know, benchmarks that don't focus on generalization might have, uh, you, you might be able to do great things to improve the training performance, but that's not really, those aren't necessarily going to be the same things that 
help you learn skills in a robust way. Um, so yeah, ultimately, uh, you know, this overfitting problem is, is a very big problem across DeepRL. And, you know, ProcGen, I think, really exemplifies this. And we can see just how overfit agents are when you only give them like 100 or 1,000 levels. Uh, using larger, better architectures somewhat helps mitigate this problem, but there's really still a long way to go. And um, our hope really is that ProcGen Benchmark and other benchmarks like it will help us make pro progress on these important issues. And we're very excited to see the methods that you all are experimenting with throughout the course of this competition. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. I'll um, hand it back to Monty, and um, I think we'll talk a bit about um, some of the competition structure a bit more. All right. Thank you so much, Carl. <clears throat> but yeah, you ended the um, you talk uh, by uh, talking about uh, you know benchmarks and um, uh, you know how. Uh, Again, benchmarks like these can basically help, uh, you know, just measure our own progress in general. But, uh, you know, benchmarks around reinforcement learning are somehow ridiculously hard to pull off. They're easy to take part in, but are still hard to kind of uh, organize them and kind of have uh, them established, right? Because in many of the cases, if we want to do a proper benchmark where we are also kind of having uh, some control over the um, uh, training uh, aspects of uh, all the submitted uh, code to the benchmark, then that itself can be restrictively expensive to be uh, um, to pull off at scale. For example, in context of uh, MineRL, which was again a very good experience, we kind of tried to pull that up last year and uh, we are still running it this year. There the whole idea is in the final round of MineRL, every submission has about four uh, GPU days, right, for the whole training and uh, given the whole design of the problem and the environment and whatnot, that becomes a very, um, uh, you know, tricky task to be able to pull off at scale. So we kind of design the competition in a way that uh, only the top submissions would go in there, so on and so forth. In case of ProcGen, that's why it becomes a little bit more uh, interesting that we can actually be, uh, can actually, the economics of this can work out that we can design a benchmark where the submissions from anyone all around the world can actually be evaluated. And in this case, I guess our goal like, it was around both sample efficiency, which is again a very um, general cause of concern in uh, reinforcement learning, but also generalization, right? Which was uh, kind of the initial focus of uh, ProcGen. And now if you look at the initial uh, design of the competition, we kind of started the competition in a way where we had the you know, warm up round, right? Where it was mostly like a teaser to kind of enable anyone to kind of come in and start engaging with the competition, right? Just play with coin run, make a submission, get used to the whole evaluation pipeline so that as we start the actual competition in round one, round two, so on and so forth, then it becomes uh, a lot more accessible. Then in round one, again, going into generalization uh, right away might be tricky because many participants are not even used to the whole flow. And then this whole idea of how well they're, um, um, especially when you're designed, uh, used to the old, old school notion of competitions per se, then the whole goal is to basically hack the metric as much as you can, squeeze out as much score as you can. Uh, then basically, and in the competitive setup, I understand how the incentives kind of in many cases force you to. So in round one, the focus was, let's ensure participants can submit the same code base where uh, sample efficiency is like a major priority. And then the same code base can perform decently well across, let's say four different uh, environments at the same time, right? That somehow, um, all the users of this benchmark to start kind of uh, looking at code where you do not have these code blo blocks with a lot of condition conditions, right? Saying that if this is the environment, then we do this and a lot of other such uh, um, uh, conditions you can put in because I remember when we were designing the rules for MineRL, we had a long series of discussions on how from in the legal rules of the competition, we basically completely forbid all these approaches. But then we also realized, and in MineRL, we kind of did that. We clearly specified this is allowed, this is not allowed. But then we also realized if we want a really good benchmark, which is also respected in a research uh, context and people are using these benchmarks for their reporting their results in research, then also the, everyone has to come in the spirit of the competition, right? The whole, just the legality of the rules and the competition design cannot be the whole thing. But round one kind of was kind of designed to kind of somehow prime everyone that the same code base should be able to perform um, relatively well across multiple different environments at the same time. And in round two, that's when we basically go into a little bit more of a depth where we basically say not only across just four different environments where uh, um, uh, in the round one, of, of course, you do not get access to information about one of the um, uh, test environments to play with. But in round two, we basically um, uh, kind of up it up, uh, up it notch a bit and we say 16 public environments and four uh, test environments. And then we basically simply uh, measure the sample efficiency also right now in the design. And the notion of generalization and other aspects uh, come in. Uh, also in the final exhaustive evaluation, which I do not think we have actually properly mentioned in here, where for the same code, we will be basically measuring how well your code um, uh, generalizes uh, across different uh, 
uh, sorry, uh, gen generalizes across levels. Where, for example, we only expose your code to 200 levels of uh, um, um, the different uh, 200 different levels uh, during the training, and then we uh, basically we can now iteratively uh, measure how well it performs across uh, the full distribution of levels. And this exhaustive evaluation is what will kind of finally define who the final winners of the competition per se. But here in the our goal is not to kind of find just one or two teams or one or two people who kind of have the best code per se. But the goal is to find this top set of people who can come together and are interested in this um, in the same problems of sample efficiency and generalization and also have good and meaningful feedback for how these benchmarks can be improved over time so that they can be reliable benchmarks for anyone who is doing any research in reinforcement learning so that we as a community of researchers can measure our progress in reinforcement learning uh, across time by using these standard benchmarks which are open and accessible to all not just a handful of researchers. So that was the broad design and here again, Carl, if you have any thoughts on your perception of the current design and uh, all the initial discussions we had, all the, const uh, all the corners we kind of cut and uh, all the constraints we face, so that we also just good to hear from uh, your point of view for the participants. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, you, one of the things that's tricky when designing a benchmark is, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're not, uh, you, you can hear me, right, Mahanti? My mic's still on? Yeah, I can, I can, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, you want to make sure that, you, you know, your benchmark isn't like overly focused on, uh, you know, I don't know, some like narrow distribution that, you, you know, you, you didn't really intend. So, you know, uh, and, and this is why we like, you know, wanted to scale up Procton to have like, you know, 16 environments. Ideally, we'd have even more, but, you know, then you just have, uh, the, it gets harder to deal with like compute requirements and stuff. Um, one of the things that's hard to, you know, when designing a competition is that you want to make sure that you're like doing a good job fairly evaluating you know, each algorithm and, and getting a good enough single signal on it, but also, you know, running competition, you know, compute requirements, you know, can, can be quite a bit. And it's, you know, not always feasible to evaluate every algorithm on like every environment all the time. Um, and so, you know, when designing like, uh, you know, choosing like, you know, in round one here, you know, th three public um, environments and, you know, one test environment, you know, it, you want to make sure that, that those four environments are really like indicative of progress on, you um, you know, the whole the benchmark as a whole and the large distribution. And that sort of as, you know, resembles the same problem you have when you, you want to make sure that kind of the 16 prop gen environments as a whole really um, are indicative of progress on like even other more complex RL environments. And uh, yeah, I think, I mean, this is just you know, something we tried to keep in mind throughout, I mean, both throughout the design of the prop gen environments themselves, as well as around just like competition design here. You want to make sure that you're really using the right metrics because it's easy to fall into um, a situation where your metrics are deceptive or, you know, maybe that maybe there's ways to easily adversarially game, game them and, and you don't want um, that to happen. But I think that we, we, really the way that Procton fights against any sort of adversarial gaming is just that, you know, when you have, you might be able to adversarially game one or two of the environments and like hard code some inductive bias that's really useful or something like that. But when you have, you know, so many environments like 16 here, it, it's less likely that some hack that you do that might yield fruit in one or two environments is really going to yield fruit on all the environments unless it's actually a very useful um, fundamental thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also, uh, can you please hear me? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So uh, yeah, in context of these things, I think valid points, right? Because when we are trying to think of how we can have these uh, benchmarks accessible to a large number of people, these aspects of uh, how can we actually come up with a good economic model in which, uh, you know, the cost uh, invested in the compute for evaluating these models is kind of somehow um, um, does not add up to a really bloated number, which is like uh, really hard uh, to kind of justify in any case. In our case, again, to kind of make this um, happen, uh, we have been extremely also lucky in that uh, on that front to have support from researchers from uh, within major organizations or across many cloud providers. In this case, it has been AWS, where Sahika and some of her colleagues with whom we have also collaborated uh, on a few projects uh, uh, came together in support of this idea. They were all, they also work on uh, mul multiple reinforcement learning stuff. And then they were like, yeah, man, this somehow adds up. And then they came in and said, okay, let's make this happen. And uh, so I'd actually uh, like to invite, thank uh, Carl first for, thank you for the talk. And we'll also probably uh, revisit uh, Carl again at the end uh, when we have um, this open discussion. But for now, I think it'd be good to basically connect this discussion that we had on the design of benchmarks and the common constraints, not only the research ones, but also the um, uh, other aspects of it and connect them to, uh, to, these, um, to uh, the research uh, that's done by Sahika and others and the work that they do uh, at AWS in context of SageMaker. And uh, I will hand it over to Sahika right now. 
Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we cannot see you. Though. All right. I will try to start my video. Hi. Oh, perfect. Hi, Sahika. Very nice meeting you all. Um, I'm with the AWS SageMaker team, a principal applied scientist, mostly focusing on reinforcement learning. Um, just a brief introduction in terms of how it came to be, as Mohanty was talking about. Um, he and I met last year at NeurIPS when we were hosting um, AWS Deep Racer Challenge in collaboration with um, AI Driving Olympics. So uh, what we were doing in that challenge was focusing on uh, generalization and sim to real, especially taking uh, deep reinforcement learning from a virtual environment into putting into a robot and seeing how we can do transfer from simulation to reality. So our concept of generalization was focused in that effort. However, um, I'm also one of the original inventors of um, Deep Racer and you can take a look at it online and find out about it. My, our main goal was most of our solution architects and developers were super excited about uh, deep reinforcement learning and what was going on in this domain. And basically they were looking <clears throat> for an educational tool that will help them teach reinforcement learning and also utilize the scale of um, AWS uh, cloud in order to run these experiments uh, fast and iterate faster. So as a team of researchers and scientists and developers, we came together and we landed on this platform. So Van Mohante came up with an opportunity to do something similar that is focusing on generalization and sample efficiency. We thought this would be also another good way for us to connect with the community and help them uh, figure out and democratize how they can use deep reinforcement learning while utilizing cloud resources. So this is how it came up to be and I would like to thank uh, both Mohanty and Carl for having us the opportunity to participate and collaborate in that effort and to make it available to you. So what I'm going to talk a little bit is about how you can use AWS SageMaker and more specifically reinforcement learning tool set that we have uh, and libraries in order to iterate very quickly. And at the end of my talk, I'm going to give you uh, a little bit of credits uh, in terms of how you can run these experiments very quickly. And we will announce some prizes for um, round one, round two, and the final round where we'll have winners. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now. And can you see my charts? Yep. Perfect. And as usual, this is a joint effort um, with uh, other applied scientists in my team. They worked very closely as a team over the last uh, couple of weeks to put this together for you. And we really would like to get your feedback moving forward. And throughout the presentation, I would call on to Anna, Jonathan, and um, uh, to talk a little bit about specific uh, parts of the solution that they had provided. So we're going to briefly describe what SageMaker is and what it does. And then I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, and Anna is going to talk about specific reinforcement learning using Ray and RL Lib. And Jonathan is going to show you the repo. Uh, and we had written lots of frequently asked questions for you to be able to quickly iterate, uh, which is parallel to um, the AI Crowd Starter Kit. And finally, I'm going to walk you through some of the results and some of experimentations that we made uh, on your behalf to show you how um, by changing some hyperparameters and instances and so forth, how you can quickly around some of these experiments at a relatively cheap cost. 
Uh, so to get started, AWS provides a large set of uh, machine learning stack. So we have several services that focuses on domain specific applications such as search, chatbots, personalization, speech and text. Um, Amazon SageMaker kind of is in between these in terms of providing machine learning services. So we have notebooks that we're going to provide today, but we also have a studio environment where you can do lots of different processing experiments, model training and tuning using our HBO service. In addition to that, we have several other services that helps you label data. If you're doing something other than reinforcement learning where you have free labels for your data set. And although today's solution is going to utilize TensorFlow, we support PyTorch and MXNet as in terms of um, other libraries that we would be using. Uh, we will also be using GPUs and CPUs in our solution. Just to iterate a little bit on how SageMaker helps you is one of the qualities of SageMaker I like the best is that I can use a I can use it as a collaborative environment to develop notebooks and code together and test it very quickly and then uh, utilize the power of GPU and CPU scaling, whether it is for deep learning or whether it is for deep um, reinforcement learning. And now I can use that notebook as a tether and run multiple training instances using EC2 instances that are specifically for training or inference under the SageMaker. So as part of the SageMaker, you use the very similar tool that you have notebook. This notebook is going to be hosted in the cloud, but it, the, through this notebook, you can also the lab, use the libraries that will help you start lots of other EC2 instances with containers for training. And one of the, the things that we, that we did for this specific challenge and also is one of the strengths of our deep reinforcement learning library is that through these notebooks, um, you can change the number of CPUs and GPUs with just one line of code and you can configure your hyperparameters for your algorithm, whether it's the KL coefficient, gamma, lambda values, and such that would help you iterate quickly. You can do all this from the familiar notebook environment and just having two files open and nothing more than that. All the scaling is taken care of using different kinds of um, uh, uh, architectures such as Ray, uh, which is what we're going to use today. And another more important thing for um, if you go beyond the progen and for example, if you want to test waters with SimTrivial and deploying your models in production, uh, you can also, once you train your model, you can deploy it in production and you can actually put your models into your robots directly from the SageMaker using the capabilities using the models that you created and you can test sim to real using deep racer platform or other platforms that are provided um, in our uh, documentation. And most recently, we also added the capability to use um, spot instances. And I had actually took this opportunity to test Progen environment that we had written for you. And I ran several uh, different hyperparameter combinations using GPUs on our managed spot training. And I consistently get 70% cost reduction using spot instances without losing inequality on the rewards that were achieved. So I would like to, at the end of the presentation, towards the end, I'm also going to talk about a little bit of what does this 70% cost saving means in terms of the next round and the following rounds in Progen. So with that, I'm going to pass it to, to Anna to talk a little bit about how the reinforcement learning library works. Anna? Hi, Sahika. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hi, um, this is Anna Law. I'll be presenting on um, specific components of our SageMaker reinforcement learning. So Amazon SageMaker RL builds on top of Amazon SageMaker, adding prepackaged RL toolkits and making it easy to integrate various simulation environments. As you would expect, training and production infrastructure is fully managed um, so that you can focus on your reinforcement learning problem or research rather than managing the service. 
Uh, today, you can use containers provided by Amazon SageMaker for TensorFlow, MXNet, as well as PyTorch. And as you roll with Amazon SageMaker, you can easily create your own custom container environment using other RL tickets or uh, packages if necessary. In terms of the RL algorithms, we support code from Intel, Ray RL lib from AnyScale, and OpenNet Baseline. And when it comes to simulation environments, SageMaker RL enables you to connect to different kinds of simulators. Um, it supports first party simulators for AWS RoboMaker, for example, and also it supports open source simulation environments that are developed using OpenAI GM interface, such as Energy Plus for HVAC and PyBullet for robotics applications. Uh, you can also build your own custom environment so you can code this up, bring that into SageMaker RL um, for sure. And sorry that I forgot to mention in terms of commercial simulators, you can also try out MassWorks Simulink. Um, and last but not least, we have a bunch of sample notebooks available uh, and they can be found at open, uh, sorry, public GitHub repo. Uh, thanks, Ahika. Um, so let's move to the model instance training on Amazon SageMaker with Manage Spot Instance. So Manage Spot Instance uses Amazon EC2 Spot Instance to run training jobs instead of on-demand instances. You can specify which training jobs use spot instances, and also you can specify a stopping condition that specifies how long SageMaker waits for a job to run using Amazon EC2 spot instances. Uh, along the way, metrics and logs generated during training rounds are available in CloudWatch. So spot instances can be interrupted, causing jobs to take longer to start or finish. You can configure your managed spot instance to use checkpoints. Uh, SageMaker copies checkpoint data from the local pass to S3. When a job is restarted, SageMaker copies the data from S3 back to the local pass. The training then can resume from the last checkpoint instead of restarting. So in terms of reinforcement learning with RLLib, Amazon SageMaker reinforcement automatically configures your uh, spot instance training to use checkpoints. Uh, so from your end, you don't need to change any things and you can just seamlessly use spot instance. Okay, um, and let me walk you through a little bit on the scaling um, features that we support in Amazon SageMaker Reinforcement Learning with Ray and RLLib. Um, essentially, we have two types of scaling, homogeneous scaling and heterogeneous scaling. The major difference here lies in whether you want to use multiple instances with the same type or you have uh, different types, for example, uh, one CPU plus multiple GPUs. So it all depends on your um, specific needs for the job or for the training. So in homogeneous scaling, all you need to do is just to specify the number of instances with the same type. And this is just one line of argument and you can start that single SageMaker, uh, Amazon SageMaker job. And if you want to mix and match CPU with GPU, uh, for example, that's often the case where it's needed in reinforcement learning because with more rollout workers, neural network updates can often become the bottleneck. Uh, so for rollout workers, you may want to use CPU instance, whereas for policy update, you may want to use GPU instance. Uh, in that case, you can use the heterogeneous scaling with different instance type together. And the diagram here essentially shows the mechanism in Amazon SageMaker in terms of how we make this communication between different instance and different SageMaker jobs happen. Right. Um, so uh, with that, I think I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, Jonathan, and to talk about more on the GitHub repo and ProcGen Startup Kit. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen. Um, just uh, can you see my screen? Okay. So um, here is our repo and um, well, right now it's private. So um, it's, we call it the SageMaker RL ProcGen Ray uh, repository. 
So uh, basically in the repository, what you would do is um, you would see a lot of uh, FAQs and um, information that Sahika mentioned. And uh, one of the most important parts is uh, to start the solution. You would press this or uh, orange uh, quick create stack button. And um, assuming that you're logged into your AWS uh, accounts uh, provider already, what you would do is you would um, you can start to create the stack right here. So once you have created the stack, uh, you should see something like this in your uh, SageMaker instance. Um, so as Sahika mentioned, that this is kind of we're using like the notebook uh, infrastructure that you can see. So um, there are several things that we that I wanted to go through in this uh, section. Um, so the first notebook is uh, training, uh, the train.ipy uh, notebook. Um, basically what this does, it, it just goes through a single instance training, which is more for um, just trying to get used to the uh, SageMaker environment. Um, one thing that is important to keep in mind is uh, what we do here is that you would launch the training job using the notebook and um, you would edit the configurations in this uh, file called the, what we call the entry point. So um, let me show you an example of the entry point. So uh, the parameters here should be quite familiar to you if you're using uh, RLib. And um, so basically StageMaker will launch a job based on these uh, parameters. And um, you can see that the job is launched right here. Uh, so one thing to keep, one additional thing to keep in mind is that what we did here was we used the capabilities of scaling to, um, to allow you to run all, at the, any number of environments that you, um, that you want. So for example, here we decided that, okay, you could run the coin run, big fish and boss fight environment, but there's nothing stopping you from running all 16 environments with the configurations that you provided. Um, so another thing is that what we did was we directly linked the, uh, the configurations of the, the SageMaker training job to the um, starter kit folder. Which what we, why we did this is tr we tried to make the submission process slightly easier for you. So everything that you do in this folder, you could directly submit it into the AI crowd for, uh, for e evaluation. So uh, let me just briefly go through uh, distributed training and uh, spot instances. So uh, as you can see here, there are three notebooks that are um, labeled with distributed. So we have the homogeneous training with GPU instances, homogeneous training with CPU instances, and the heterogeneous uh, training with um, both CPU and GPU instances. So just for example, I'll go uh, describe the homogeneous distributed training. Um, so as you can see here, the notebook configuration is fairly similar to the um, train notebook, the single instance notebook. And um, the most important part of this notebook is that you could launch a spot instance here, and uh, which Sahika will go into slightly more detail uh, later. Um, so finally, I would just want to go through the uh, heterogeneous scaling notebook. Um, so once again, the configuration of the notebook is slightly, it's quite similar. Um, it's slightly different in a way that we would have to create a virtual private network, but um, mostly that's uh, obscured to you. You would only have to go through the RL estimator, which is similar to the previous notebooks. Um, so I, I think that's it. I will hand it back to uh, Sahika and we would share the repo and make the repo public at the uh, end of this webinar. I, I believe, yeah. So Sahika, thank you. Yes, you need to stop share. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay. 
So um, I looked through a few of the questions while uh, Jonathan was going through the repo. Um, so Jonathan is going to be making the repo public after the webinar. Uh, so you should be able to have access to it uh, within, within an hour or so. And what I would like to talk also a little bit about is there were a few more questions about um, how you can do hyperparameter search. And um, so I'm gonna briefly walk through the experiments that I had done quickly. And then if there are any further detailed questions, we can, we can do a deep dive after the presentation. So just to, do, uh, just to go through it briefly, um, uh, in order to test this part instance, so I did basically run the very same experiment. And I also want to make sure that um, I run these experiments with Impala, so you have an idea about how having a large neural network is going to impact your solution. And I also want to note that it is really important that for the Impala one especially, you need to copy the hyperparameters from the YAML file exactly as is to recreate the results. Because uh, there's a hyperparameter optimization there that makes your solutions uh, gain more rewards as you are testing things more for generalization moving forward. What I want to mention is that um, it doesn't matter whether you're using a, a, a regular instance versus a spot instance. Um, with 20 nodes using GPU P3 to X large, it has one GPU and eight um, virtual CPUs. Uh, I was able to spawn 20 nodes in both spot and non-spot instances. And in half an hour, I was able to reach close to 5 million steps. So this should enable you to test your solutions very quickly, um, even if it is not hyperparameter, but some algorithmic changes. And as you can see from the reward uh, perspective, it didn't change much. And um, also in this case, having to run with uh, 20 nodes, I did keep the, the, uh, the, band, the, the baseline parameters from the, the Impala YAML with 0.2 and 0.1 uh, for GPUs um, for training and GPUs uh, per worker. Now, if we were to, um, I run this experiment several times and I consistently get 70% savings. So um, I'm confident that you'll be able to um, run with spot instances with P3 GPU and uh, achieve relatively good savings in order to iterate quickly when you make algorithm changes and or hyperparameter changes. To quickly calculate the rates from our September 1st pricing uh, for this instance was about $4.3 per hour and if you use 20 instances, such as what I did here um, for half an hour, it will be $43. With spot instance, uh, this has come down to about one third of the price, which is $12. Now, if you want to iterate further using the actual uh, numbers um, from uh, from the, the Impala YAML. And all these graphs, um, you can obtain these graphs by going to CloudWatch. Uh, so what you do basically is you go to the training jobs uh, in the cloud, uh, in the SageMaker menu, which is also web-based. And in that console, you find your job, click on it, and all the graphs that you need with the metrics that you need for the, the, the competition are provided to you. Uh, we had um, extracted those parameters. In addition, you can also check your CPU and GPU utilization. So these graphs basically are copied from the training jobs on the SageMaker console, and you just scroll down. And if you want to do further debugging, you can also use CloudWatch logs by clicking view logs on the web console. Um, so if you want to do quick uh, parameter, uh, hyperparameter optimization without actually utilizing HPO and just running the jobs for 20 minutes. Um, so what I did was I started out, let's say that the mini batch size, uh, the original one was 2048. And um, I changed it a little bit to 256 and see what happens. And you can actually get relatively good idea about where your experiments are going uh, in 20 minutes. 
So in 20 minutes um, with these configurations, I was able to reach more than 3.5 million steps. And now you give a little more GPUs and you scale down your workers. You can actually have 4 million steps, 20 minutes. And um, now what you can do is you can increase the mini batch size to its full glory. And now you can see actually you're getting better rewards with this hyperparameter tuning. But having to have this increase will require you to use more of the GPUs. So you have to make a trade off between. So when you're doing these scaling experiments with SageMaker, you have to be smart about it. And I gave you three ways of increasing the number of steps within the same amount of time limit that you have. And all these experiments with the spot instance will cost you no more than $10 and you will be able to iterate quickly in 20 minutes. Now, uh, with your credits, you're not limited to the instance that you use. So you can also increase your uh, instance to another GPU, which is going to double the price. Um, a little more than double the price, but it will allow you to use more GPUs um, uh, per instance. So with the ATX large, you can go up to, to four GPUs and you can now actually reach the 8 million steps that you want in 20 minutes and using the mini batch size uh, that is appropriate for Impala. As you can see that, uh, again, this solution will cost you um, 70% savings with the spot instance consistently across multiple ones. Um, we have only a couple of minutes left. I will take on the Q and A's after, uh, after this, but I think this is the part that you are all uh, waiting for, <laughs> I hope. Um, so you may think that, oh, well, you know, this costs a couple of dollars, but how I can uh, try these differences while I'm trying to win a challenge. So one of our goals in providing these cred uh, this notebook solution is that you can use the credits that are provided to you as part of the prizes and quickly iterate through some of your hyperparameter or algorithm changes. As you can see, in 20 minutes by spending $8, you were able to gather uh, quite a bit of information about where you should take your next experiments and iterate quickly at a lower cost. So the top 200 participants in the round two will be receiving $50. So you can retrospectively go back and press the quick launch button and test some of the experiments. Um, again, with spot instances, it's just $8 to run most of these experiments. Uh, and you can test and learn about SageMaker and could have, uh, also understand how you can use this for other competitions. Um, you're not restricted to using your credits for Progen. It is up to you how you want to use it. Um, we want you to get familiar and understand how you can leverage uh, the, the scaling and also provide feedback for our Pojan solution. But the credits are provided to you on your uh, behalf uh, to do what you want to do, what you want to learn and get out of this Pojan as well as um, uh, using the SageMaker solution. Uh, for the round, um, the top 50 teams uh, at round one uh, who qualify for round two will get an additional uh, $500 in credits per team. And this could be again used to support your round two competition, which I highly recommend. Um, uh, but it's up to your discretion, discretion. And finally, in the top 10 teams at the end of the round two, you'll be able to use $1,000 in AWS credits to run experiments to win this um, challenge. Again, I strongly encourage um, that you could use our scaling and hyperparameter as you wish uh, for this challenge. And I'm pretty confident that you will be able to come up with several different ways to solve this problem using our solution as I head down over the, the, the last week or so just using um, the, the starter kit and Impala as a starting point. So I'm going to stop here for now and uh, pass it to Mohanty for next action items. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sahika, for announcing uh, the prizes. Uh, so uh, again, um, we uh, that these are the AWS credits that we are uh, will be giving away to uh, the top uh, 200 participants of the first round, the top 50 teams of the second round, and the top 10 teams of uh, you know the final exhaustive round uh, overall. And these are uh, these are all in addition. So if you are in the top five, uh, if you are say a five member team um, in uh, and are um, have qualified to round two, then you will get the $500 for your team plus uh, $50 per team member from uh, round one uh, if you're among the top 200 uh, participants of course which I hope should work and uh, then if you are uh, in um, if you are in the top 10 participants uh, at the end of round two then it will be another $1,000 in AWS credits for the top 10 uh, teams there uh, someone has already asked uh, so the prize is just AWS credits uh, it, it gets politically tricky, but uh, we do have possibilities for some more uh, prizes, which are not AWS credits, but we will take another week or a little bit more uh, time in general to answer that. So uh, there will be a little bit more of prizes, which will be announced. But for now, these are the about $45,000 in AWS credits, which are um, set aside, which will be kind of sent out uh, for uh, the top participants. And again, this is a little bit non-traditional model because in most competitions, we basically give away a large amount of cash prize to the drop for second, third party um, uh, teams and participants. But in this case, we are trying to do both the models where there will be some other alternate prizes for the top three uh, uh, prizes, which will be announced later. But for all the um, participants who have been involved in the whole uh, project journey, journey and have uh, put in a lot of effort, they will be uh, basically getting uh, the same, uh, some uh, kind of AWS credits uh, to kind of uh, continue support uh, uh, this work. Now, uh, to uh, move on, I think we have uh, um, we have Kwang, uh, who is uh, rank 11th on the leaderboard, who would be joining in to kind of speak uh, a little bit about his experience taking part in the competition, uh, his views on blockchain, so on and so forth. So I guess I would uh, like to invite Kwang now to basically join in. Did I get the name right? Yes. Hello, can you guys hear me? Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about my background, my path to reinforcement learning in this competition, and some tips that I find is fun in this competition. So I am a recent graduate. My major in college is math and computer science, and I'm now working as a data scientist at a cybersecurity company. My path to reinforcement learning is pretty random. I did some natural language processing and computer vision related project in college. So most of them use supervised and unsupervised learning, not much reinforcement learning. So I was really curious to learn about reinforcement learning. I decided to explore RL about four months ago. So I think RL is pretty important because so many people may say that most knowledge for a general artificial intelligence could be learned through supervised learning because you can find almost everything on the internet. But I think for a piece of knowledge to be useful, the agent must apply that piece of knowledge in the real world environment, which lead directly back to reinforcement learning. So I think everything will, will lead back in to reinforcement learning if we want to make a general intelligence. So when I study reinforcement learning, sample and sample efficiency and generalization pop up many times. And they seem to be the main problems that prevent the wide application of reinforcement learning in real world. It's also pretty interesting to combine both sample efficiency and generalization in this competition, because you usually have one or the other, not both. For example, if your sample efficiency is not good, then you have to train your agent in a simulation or you generalize it in the real world. But if your sample efficiency is good, you can train it directly in the real world. But since the real world environment is limited, more limited than the simulation, your generalization will not be really good. So 
the the idea of the of this competition of combining both sample efficiency and generalization is a very interesting idea. Then you have the best of, best of both worlds. So some tips that I find really in, really like help me a lot in this competition. Um, so some environments are much more robust than other environments in with respect to changes in hyperparameters. So when you guys do hyperparameters tuning, uh, maybe remove the environments that are robust to hyperparameters before you tune, or like only tune on sensitive environments. So that would save some computing times and credit. And another tip that I might that might be helpful for you guys is you may want to play the game yourself, not like use an agent, but like boost, play the game as a human. Because the set, the, the set of games in blockchain is really diverse and you may find many interesting things that would help you design your network and algorithm so that it works for all environments. For example, some interesting environments in Cave Flyer, which is an environment where you fly an aircraft in a cave, it's really beneficial for you to know the velocity of the aircraft. But a single observation will not tell you this information. So you might want to stack some frames so that your solution works across all environments. Another example is, for example, Jumper, which is similar to Koiran, but you can double jump. So it might be beneficial for you to, beneficial for the network to remember if the agent has jumped once or not. So maybe a recur recurrent network is necessary in the highest environment. You need to match the key to the lock with the same color. So maybe a gray scale observation may not work for this. You may need to use the full color observation. So the, my experience with this uh, competition has been really positive so far. It has so many, many things I, I came up with. Like I, I can test with many environments and they all go really fast. And that's, that's so now thing. I want to maybe change back to. Thanks, thanks, Kwong. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, now I'll uh, uh, pass it on to Mohanty. Uh, Mohanty, you can introduce Jyotish. Uh, hello. Oh, sorry. I was also transitioning, but uh, yeah. Now, so uh, thanks, Juan, uh, for um, um, just talking about your experience. And again, we have uh, uh, designed this benchmark with this idea that it is accommodating to researchers of varying degrees of uh, experience. And we welcome you in the community, and uh, we are here to help in any way we can to uh, while you kind of uh, do your research around projects. So thank you so much. Next up, uh, to pull off something like this, um, like the blockchain benchmark involves a lot of headaches, like a lot of headaches from the initial implementation where um, someone has the bright idea of using RLlib and enforcing it. And that was mine, by the way, where I basically wrote the initial starter kit uh, uh, with the idea that we wanted to experiment with this because we ran a lot of uh, RL challenges where we let participants do their own, own thing, and which is fine. Everyone has their own preferences. But we said, can we stop imagining these things as competitions, but imagining this as this uh, large research project in a giant lab? where let's say we have many visiting researchers come in for a whole summer and all of us are working on this together. In that case, if everyone is coming up with their own implementation, it becomes a lot more tricky to basically figure out how to kind of aggregate it all together. So that's why I had the bright idea that uh, let's just say, let's run this experiment by using RLIM because I'm decently familiar with uh, uh, RLIM. And then Jyotish um, was there and he 
uh, ended up uh, working with me on the problem and he did not have any experience in narrative in the beginning and in the process he has been one of the uh, person who has been uh, you know quite instrumental in making lives easier for all of you participants and also for us in executing this competition so first i would uh, thank jyotish a lot a ton for helping make this happen and just for his sheer patience now i would basically uh, invite jyotish to come over and speak with his camera on he's a little bit camera shy uh, about um, uh, a few things that we wanted to talk about progen uh, the competition many of the issues that you um, face we had a lot of internal discussions about many of the points you raised many of uh, the harsh and good criticisms you had in the feedbacks but they are very beneficial for us because we want to use them to figure out how to improve this benchmark uh, over time so jyotish over to you where uh, are you there jyotish uh, yeah i'm there okay all right so jyotish over to you with camera on okay let's go yes okay Um, yeah, I hope my screen is visible. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so yeah, so most of the feedbacks had a very common thing that is uh, that they were feeling it a bit hard to use RLib. Uh, we understand that. Like uh, we understand that there will be some friction initially, uh, but. One, that is one of the reasons why we had a warm up round like for you to get acquainted with the starter kit rlib and try to understand how things are happening so and one more thing is we don't want you to fret over getting the submissions to work so if you feel that you are spending more time than you should on some certain implementation aspect of rlib do feel free to just post it on the forums that is discord or you can also drop a message on the discord channel uh, i'm pretty sure Uh, one of us or the community will definitely help you out in that aspect so as monty mentioned like uh, this is an experiment that we are trying out here uh, that is imposing the framework and the idea is to make sure like at the end of the competition uh, we want to basically ask the participants to send out to send us a pull request uh, so that we can merge all of their sub like solutions into the starter kit so and we believe doing something like this will uh increase the impact that this competition is going to have and and one so we actually have a post on this course uh showing like explaining how you can debug it, most common things that you might face during the submissions uh, so i'll probably just walk you over it just in case you missed it out uh so yeah so once you make a submission uh there are different things that we show uh, the first thing would be like uh, what are the phases that are involved and how like at which phase the current like at which phase the current evaluation is at and uh, what happened to the past phases or like what was the status of the phase and so on so uh, i think the color coding is quite intuitive and along with that if some phase fails we try our best to give you a good good error message but uh, sometimes we understand that uh, it's uh, it's hard to um uh, tell why exactly the submission failed so in that case we just show you a generic message like training failed or inference failed uh, but uh, if you notice like uh, there is a small link under this descriptions which will take you to a dashboard kind of thing and that is where you can find all your training logs so uh yeah like uh, when you look at this logs initially probably you might be confused because they are like uh, the newest logs are at the top uh, yeah once you get accustomed to it it's actually much intuitive than having it from top to bottom so you can actually go through the logs and figure out how why exactly your training failed and so on and there are two most common issues that we saw across the submissions and one is uh, figuring out the resources that they need to use so the evaluations are uh, right now run on 8 vcpus and one gpu so you need to make sure that this certain formula holds whenever you are making a submission uh, if you don't do this the submission will just fail like uh, it will just rlib will just complain saying uh, it can't request the uh, resources that you mentioned in your configuration uh, and one thing to note here is uh, okay let's probably just walk over what these uh, things exactly mean 
So RLIB has two kinds of workers. One is the training worker and the other is the rollout worker. So when you mention the number of workers here, that's actually the rollout workers. And the job of this rollout workers is to sample uh, from the progen environments. And the number of VMEs is basically how many progen environments that you want to run per rollout worker. And there is one more parameter, num GPUs, which is basically how much of the GPU resources uh, does your training worker is expect is your training worker expected to take and the other is number of GPUs per worker which is how much of the GPU do you want to allocate per rollout worker. So one thing to note here is RLIP doesn't actually do this GPU allocation. These numbers are uh, these numbers basically exist so that you can scale out RLIP like just like how Sahika mentioned you can use multiple instances and run your uh, experiments on multiple instances at once. That is when these parameters are going to be useful. Uh, but you need to remember that these are not something RLA will force. Like even if you say take 0.5% of the G, like 0.5 of the GPU doesn't mean RLA will try to allocate only half of the GPU. It is just used to scale the workers properly across different nodes. But in the context of the competition, uh, on a single node that is, uh, probably doesn't matter. But uh, while you're experimenting with different, like on multiple nodes and all, these are going to be really, really helpful for you. And the other most frequently asked question is how do we fit? Like uh, we get a lot of uh, out of memory exceptions on the GPU and how do we figure out uh, how, how much of G, like uh, these, uh, how do we make sure that submissions don't get these OM exceptions? So one thing you can do is uh, just probably uh, set the number of workers to one and start the training phase. And in a new terminal, you can just type NVIDIA SMI and it should actually give you a nice view of what all processes are running and how much each process takes, like how much GPU memory each process takes. So for example, if you are running PPO, uh, this will be the training worker, which probably takes the most of the GPU memory available. And the others will be rollout workers. They will actually be labeled rollout workers. So you don't need to uh, figure out what is the rollout worker and which one is the training worker. So once you have an idea of how much each of these things are taking, uh, you can quickly come up with some number so that uh, the total number of workers is still less than eight. And the, to the total amount of GPU uh, that you use, that is uh, using these num GPUs per worker and num GPUs is still less than one. And you also need to make sure that the total amount of actual memory that all these workers together use is less than 16 GB. And that should actually give, should, that should not uh, give you any more GPU OMS. And one more thing is uh, TensorFlow, we uh, at least observed that TensorFlow is uh, very sensitive to the versioning thing. Like for example, uh, we were able to run the exact Impala baseline that was there on the starter kit on a 1080 Ti using TensorFlow 1.4, but with TensorFlow 2.2, we were not able to do it. We had to reduce the number of workers a bit. So uh, do make sure that uh, when you're submitting, you're using the same version of TensorFlow or PyTorch, even during at, at the at, at evaluation phase, uh, or else you might still end up having a lot of uh, OM errors or something like that. Uh, and since the like we do have a submission quota and we actually encourage people to try running the code that they submit locally so that they won't be wasting the submission quota because uh, it's only five so it's very easy to make silly mistakes and the submission quota of five per day will be just exhausted very easily so we recommend that uh, you guys run the code locally first and we also mentioned how to properly test the code here. We'll also like uh, in few days, we'll also be adding a few helper scripts to the starter kit, which will help you set up the progen environment that is install all the dependencies and all. And we'll also try to add a few scripts that can help you test how your Docker builds work and like some simple test to run some quick training and rollout sessions so that you're sure that the code works locally. And these are some common things that you should probably uh, look at once your submission fails. And if you feel this is not helping and you're not able to figure it out, uh, just do feel free to tag a crowd bot and one of the members of a crowd team will come and help you out with the submission. And 
one more question we uh, okay let's go back uh, yeah so one more common question we had was uh, how do i use custom metrics because uh, we do provide the so if you look at the issue page uh, we show the reward like minimum mean and maximum rewards at, on the issue page itself and on the dashboard also we somewhat show the same information so a lot of people have been asking how do i add my own metrics or how do i see other metrics so coming to the adding metrics part so there is something called callbacks.py in the starter kit itself uh, you can just check it out all we uh, so we commented a lot of things on how each of the functions there can be used so let's say if you want to expose some metric at the end of every episode so what all that you need to do is just add this part in your custom callbacks and just do episode dot custom metrics and just it's a it's basically a dictionary uh, you just need to define the name of the metric and add some value so rl will collect these metrics and it will internally generate three entities for each of this so for example if your metric is my met it will generate three uh, entities a my metric min my metric max and my metric mean and we do collect these metrics and you can properly visualize it on the grafana dashboard that we provide so coming to the visualization part uh, yeah we you probably won't see all these drop downs initially because these are still experimental so we thought uh, it might be better not exposing them initially because uh, if you end up clicking something else uh, the content of your dashboard will become empty so you'll have to close the window again and go back to the issue page and open it again uh, so to avoid the confusions uh, we basically uh, decided not to expose it directly but if you want to play around with your custom metrics so all you need to do is uh, open your dashboard hit the escape key and you will be able to see these drop downs so in the custom metrics part uh, so if you exposed any custom metrics they should be available under custom metrics slash whatever key you mention so you can just click uh, whatever metrics you want to visualize and if you expand one of the environments uh, yeah you should be able to see them plotted under the custom metrics part so this was one of the most asked questions in the feedback as well and there is a post on discourse uh, i linked it here i'll probably share the deck once the webinar is finished uh, so that's about the custom metrics part and yeah so there are a lot of common questions we got so one thing was uh, we do and like yeah so basically the default submissions that you make if you just submit the starter kit it runs on tensorflow and it works fine but we noticed that a few people actually a lot of people were using pytorch and they were having issues when submitting their solutions using pytorch so we added a short post uh, showing how you can make your submissions using pytorch it's not complicated actually it's pretty simple uh, it, there are few modifications that you need to make that is uh, you need to make sure that you are using a pytorch version that is supported by cuda version that we have so on the evaluation cluster we can support till cuda 10.1 so you can use any cuda version until 10.1 but not beyond 10.1 uh if at all we are supporting cuda 10.2 we will definitely make an announcement but at the moment we only support till cuda 10.1 so whatever pytorch your version you are using please make sure that it works with the cuda version that is available in your uh, evaluation environment so uh, so there are uh, yeah and one more thing you need to note is uh, these pytorch versions that are compatible to a specific cuda environment are not available on the pyfy package index so you will have to explicitly mention where we like pip has to find these packages so that is why you need to add this line here and yeah this is uh, so yeah this is one more important thing so even if you make changes to your uh, requirements.txt file we won't actually detect the changes you need to set the docker build flag to true in your acro.json file only then we detect these changes and we'll try to build a docker image using the requirements.txt that you have modified and yeah these are pretty much simple rl modifications that you need to make and yeah this should uh, uh, so this is basically 
how you can run the Impala CNN torch that we have provided in the starter kit. Uh, and hopefully this should be enough to get you started with uh, your own versions of solutions as well. Uh, yeah, so we have received few uh, complaints saying the starter kit doesn't work for them. Uh, we tested the starter kit properly on Python 3.7. If at all you, I, I, and yeah, we tested it on Linux and Mac as well. Uh, if there are any issues, we recommend that you use some Conda environment, either mini Conda or Anaconda. And if you set up things using that, I'm sure that everything should work seamlessly. And even after that, if you have any issues, please do feel free to reach out to us on Discourse or Discord channel. And yeah, as I mentioned previously, we'll make a few scripts available to set up these things up for you. Uh, we already discussed about the OM exceptions part. Yeah, and we received a few, uh, some people were not happy with internet not working during evaluations. Uh, that is expected. Uh, we block internet access during the evaluation so that you don't send the data out. Uh, this is an expected behavior, not an unexpected behavior. Uh, yeah, so right now uh, the co su submission quota is on a rolling window basis. Uh, so we have a moving window uh, which tracks uh, how many submissions you have made in a 24 hour period window. So we are also working on bringing a fixed window thing. Uh, we are working on it and as soon as it's available, we'll make an announcement on it. Uh, yeah, so metric hacking is probably up for a discussion. Uh, we think we have to share some of the metrics so that uh, the new people, like people who are new to reinforcement learning actually find it uh, uh, convenient to work with. We are not exposing too many things. So I still think uh, even if you are able to hack it, it's not to a very huge extent, but later on we will be introducing more and more environments and more private environments as well. So the metric hacking issue should not be so much critical at that point. But if you still feel uh, it is an important issue, there is an active thread that is running on this one. So do feel free to share your thoughts there. And yeah, we were also asked to start if, start start some sort of officers. Uh, yeah, we will definitely do that. We'll soon post the details about the officers on this course. Uh, yeah, and yeah, I think most of you are familiar with the two very, very uh, unexpected issues that were not supposed to happen. So everything is green and still my submission got marked as false. Uh, yeah, that's an issue on our end and we fixed it and that should not happen anymore. We fixed it recently actually. So these things should not be happening anymore. At, uh, so this part is fixed. You are guaranteed to not get it anymore. And another common thing is nothing started and my submission failed. Uh, yeah, we did fix it and we are still trying to catch a few corner cases here, but we believe uh, at this point, the number of times you get these sort of errors should be minimized. Uh, actually, after today, you should probably not get these sort of errors. Uh, and if there are any other issues that come up during the evaluations, uh, we will definitely address them. Uh, so you don't need to worry about your submission quota getting exhausted or something like that. Yeah, I think that's it from me. All right, thank you, Jyotish. And um, uh, while I guess all the participants are muted, I can hear them. Thank you for all the support you have provided uh, through the forums. And uh, now we should ideally be opening up the floor for any broad set of questions that, part, um, that the participants in this webinar have. Carl, are you still around? Yep, I'm still here. Yeah. So uh, we will wait for any questions that uh, um, uh, the participants would have. Um, uh, and uh, you can just ask uh, us the questions in the open Q&A uh, session, or which seems to be a little bit confusing, feel free to basically uh, just uh, dump down your questions in the chat. But in the uh, meantime, uh, I'm not sure if others went through the questions which have been already answered. It'd be good to quickly go through the questions that were kind of answered. Uh, so Carl answered some of them, Cycle also answered some of them, uh, but uh, we can just uh, use those questions to kind of start a quick uh, discussion. I think the first one was uh, by Florian, will Sonic ever be a part of the PropGen uh, games? So there uh, Carl mentioned that, yeah, uh, probably not. It'll be very difficult to modify the source code. Um, 
to be possibly generate levels in a similar way and then uh, another question which was also related is about this notion of rl complexity i wanted to connect both of them in uh, some ways and ask because we designed a uh, four test and four private test environments uh, right just for this um, uh, competition and then you had mentioned that the investment in terms of time and resources is not really significant in that case my question was broadly how difficult would it be to open it up to let participants or general users in the community design their own environments so that they can challenge others with this environments then we basically can in principle go to another way where we are measuring the rl co complexity of these um, environments in a crowd source way where people come up with these tasks and we see how well these um, our classic standard implementations of pp or other things without any hyperparameter tuning perform well or with some yeah, it's, it's actually a really interesting thing about like crowdsourcing environment design and stuff. I mean, some, um, I don't know how many people are familiar with like the general video game AI work that's been done, um, but, th but they, they sort of have tried to like crowdsource this kind of stuff before where, uh, I mean, they, they use, all their games kind of use, um, you know, this grid world sort of environment um, and they have like, uh, you know, common sprites for all of them. And then part of, part of uh, I mean, I, I'm not super familiar with a lot of specifics, but you know they've cre they've like created a set of you know well quite a bit more than 16 environments anyway um, that were like a lot of um, people have submitted their own environments um, and there are uh, yeah I think I think the you know you can you can get a lot of like um, you know high quality environment contributions from the external community which is nice I think one thing that's tricky is that you know individual either participants or researchers or anyone who's using this might have like their own questions that are the most interested in. So for instance, like ProcGen made very, you know, explicit design decisions around like trying to downplay the issues of memory and exploration, you know, like exploration is a little bit a part of it, but there's no environments in ProcGen where like exploration is, you know, the the like key bottleneck. And, and the same sort of thing is true for memory. Or someone else might come along and say that like th that's actually the issue that they're like most interested in. And, and there's a lot of different things that like a lot, a lot of different directions any given, you know, researcher could, uh, choose to take environment design and, um, you know, the pros, pros and cons to any of this, it can just get a little bit unwieldy. And so, um, yeah, that, that's sort of what you have to think about. You know, if, if we were design design like four games, four new games, and like all of them had a very heavy dependence on memory, for instance, then it's very likely that the kinds of things that worked well in the current proc gen set like wouldn't transfer to those ones. And so ideally you'd have some way of like breaking out this complexity, which, which is certainly what, you know, what this question is getting at. I just think it's a, it's a very hard, uh, you know, question to deal with. And so, you know, uh, it relates to this question of RL complexity, where because you see it in context of uh, individual environments. But uh, there was this uh, paper, right, or this uh, broad set of uh, this approach called as B suit, right, behavioral suit. This was done by a large group of people, including David Silver, Richard Sutton, and others. So there, they mm -hmm. came up with a small set of really simple tasks which were designed and then whenever you basically come up with your own uh, RL approach or modification to PP or whatever, then you basically get this nice graph which tells you uh, for this approach how well it is performing. So in that case, yeah. you could imagine if you could meaningfully open up on how people can contribute their own proc gen environments, like as a, a, a pull request to a contrib um, library or something like that, and then they describe or we somehow figure out on what these attributes are and then based on that, people can start exploring the landscape they based on their own research experiments and start contributing yeah. to a centralized uh, benchmark which could be uh, quite interesting in general yeah well one, one thing to know on b-suite is you know they kind of go for um like a lot, a lot of the environments in b-suite really emphasize like certain like archetypal rl problems like yeah, one yeah. will focus on you know like this is the b-suite environment for like exploration and so it like has like a very very classic kind of exploration problem built into it and like if your RL agent has something that's very good at dealing with exploration, then maybe you'll have a chance. And if it doesn't, it'll just like get a flat score. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, I think they, you know, right. They came up with like seven different categories of like kinds of things, you know, like, um, you know, uh, like, yeah, like how well does it perform over like longer discount horizons or like how well is it? Yeah. Memory was certainly one of them as well. Um, and uh, yeah. So and then they, 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 they put, put a, a lot of thought into this sort of like classification and um you know, and, and certainly if you were to like contribute new environments, like any of the new environments that would were get approved by BC would be sweet would have to be ones that like, you know, the yeah. committee reviewing really thought, oh, yes, this is like, you know, driving at a core RL problem. I mean, ProcGen is a bit more of a like mishmash of a lot of things there. Like there's no none, none of the environments in ProcGen are like so much dealing with like one archetypal RL problem. They're just like, you know, they're, they're, there's a lot of things to play. And we tried to like, you know, make them more tractable and like 
I mean, again, as I was mentioning with exploration memory, like they're not like hugely emphasizing those, but there's still like many different, um, you know, many different things that make any given project environment difficult. And so it's hard to like isolate and abstract about that. So, you know, you can imagine a similar thing where like, you know, we, we, we have uh, submissions to, you know, people's like submit the environments they're excited about. And then there's some committee kind of like thinks, oh yes, these are the ones that are, or, like tries to classify them in some useful way or something. Um, yeah, no, I, I like that approach in that case. In fact, um, the, many of the environments which actually went into B suite way, actually they it followed this pattern of these, um, um, a, a lot of really respected reinforcement learning researchers, including certain others on how they basically pretty much evolved the whole field, right? By asking these really small toy problems, have a problem we had and whatnot. And then these problems may become epitome of this one aspect, right? Where you are focusing on the, just this one aspect. And then now basically there's this uh, group of people who would approve this or not. But this alternate idea is more about, is not just one, but it's more real world where it's a co combination of multiple aspects, which are represented by this uh, particular environment that someone designed. And this environment somehow becomes, um, again, is contributed and the community somehow decides based on their usage of this environment on how difficult or easy, or they start rating across all these different aspects. But just an idea, putting it out there, if anyone wants to uh, basically follow up on it, uh, you guys should. And if it works out, buy us all of you. <laughs> uh, the uh, other one was this uh, notion of RL complexity. I think uh, Ronnie Alvis, he asked that. So I think that, that itself is a, a very interesting topic, which uh, keeps coming up. And I guess I thought it would be good if you basically, uh, you know, take a little bit more time to explain your answer there. Just you know your thoughts on RL complexity and um, uh, measure it, uh, the complications and corner cases around it, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, again, like, you know, just to zero in on coin run or something, there's like clearly many different generalization challenges in coin run, like th things that make the, you know, the whole environment distribution difficult. Like you could, and it's pretty easy to like isolate them experimentally if you want. So one is just the fact that, you know, the agent has to learn to generalize across like the different sprites, the different like, you know, colors and shapes that the objects can take and stuff like that. And you know, to, you know, so if you want to, to evaluate how big of a difference this makes, you can just train on a version of coin run that, that uses fixed sprites and it doesn't vary any of these things. You know, the walls always look the same. The background always looks the same. You know, the agent always looks the same. And then you, you find that, okay, well now suddenly the agent has an easier time learning because it doesn't have to be robust to these axes of variation. So that's like one kind of thing, you know, and another, another thing is like the, the physics in coin run obviously has a huge impact on like how difficult or not it, um, the environment is. And so you can, you know, run very targeted experiments to determine like what the impact of physics are is. And particularly if you're like, you know, interested in meta learning or you want to, you know, coin run always uses a fixed set of physics hyperparameters, but if you wanted to, you could like vary those. And, you know, the, the coin run distribution could even be more broad by, you know, randomly sampling those at the start of every episode. And then you can evaluate like, well, how well, how, you know, good are agents learning? Um, how good are they at generalizing across different sets of physics? Um, and so you and, and and so you yeah you really have these like and in a lot of ways we kind of would expect these um, these things to be like fairly orthogonal like the kinds of things that you know improve the agent's ability to generalize to different physics sets are probably pretty different than the ones that you know help it recognize different sites and stuff. I mean certain things like the fact that larger architectures are just better generalizing from images are going to you know probably be more general than others. Um, but yeah, it, it could certainly be useful to have like a better understanding of what. Um, what each of these individual like sources of complexity is. And you can imagine going through that sort of thought experiment for many of the different environments. Um, I think that, you know, I think the simple reality is just that there's, there's a lot of different sources of complexity in like the real world. And so in, in the video games we can design, there's also lots of different sources of complexity and it's hard to, um, it's hard to kind of like break them down into manageable chunks. And, also, because you mentioned, right, right now, empirically, even if we think about it, we are only always talking about sample efficiency and generalization, right? So there's not many other models uh, in which we can look at. But the way you hinted at this notion of, you know, coin run having these different um, uh, ways in which, uh, you know, it challenges a particular agent, which is trying to learn so on and so forth. So you probably are also hinting at this uh, possibility of existence of differentiable environments. So you could imagine a whole family of coin run variants, which are differentiable by particular parameters. And then you basically run a bunch of experiments to kind of figure out uh, where you kind of get uh, higher sample efficiency, where you get higher generalization, so on and so forth. And that will need a lot of compute, but that's a broader question. Yeah. Uh, uh, on that, uh, I would open up uh, anyone else if they want to ask any questions, else we are a little bit off um, uh, beyond time, with 10 minutes uh, beyond deadline, and I'm getting a few messages that we shouldn't exceed this call beyond 90 minutes. And um, 
if we do not get any more questions, we are happy to kind of end this uh, webinar with a thank you note to all the panelists and also all the participants who have been putting so much time and effort and energy into uh, taking part in the PropGen competition. It has been overwhelming to see all the activity around the competition. And I really hope to kind of uh, reach that, uh, you know, the end of the competition where uh, we can actually get all the pull requests from you into this public repository in a single place. That is one thing I keep repeating. It would be so cool, um, basically, whenever we can do that. And, uh, Tim, uh, uh, Tim raised his hand. So, Tim, you can uh, ask uh, a question. Okay, all right. So, we have uh, a question from Tim. Yeah. Uh, I just want to start off by, by saying thanks to all of you guys who are involved. Um, Jodish especially is, has helped me out so much and I appreciate all the hard work that you guys are doing. Um, I had a question for Carl. I, so in my, in my experience with ProcGen, I know that um, a lot of the different environments have different time step limits. Um, Big Fish notably has a time out of 6,000 steps um, compared to a lot of the other ones, which are 1,000. So I was curious, just um, was it a goal for you, Carl, to have the environments to be a similar time step level to be solved? I don't know if that makes a lot of sense. I was just curious if that was something that you guys considered when you were building these environments and how that plays yeah. into the evaluation time that, that we're supposed to be shooting for in this competition. Yeah, that's that, that's a really good question. I mean, yeah, I think Big, Big Fish is a bit of an outlier in terms of just like just how much time it needs to complete. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't I don't think any of our um, our like seek hidden test environments are going to require um, that, as much time there. I mean, that, that that one makes it particularly difficult just to do evaluations and to do to do enough evaluations to get the standard deviation low to like have have a reliable signal. I mean, Big Fish it, it's not. The, the longer time, like longer number of steps to episode completion actually makes big fish any harder to train in that case because, you know, you're still, it's still, you're still only using a discount horizon of, you know, whatever you're using, whether it's 0.99 or 0.999 or like, uh, and so the agent isn't really actually optimizing over like the 6,000 steps. Um, the reason it is 6,000 steps is just because, yeah, like, you know, that's how long it takes to complete the game. We, uh, for choosing the, um, you know, the episode timeouts, we pretty much, um, I mean, try to just make it like give the agent reasonable enough time to complete it, but also like the timeout is important because obviously if you don't have a timeout, the agent might just like sit on the beginning of a level forever and ever and just waste a bunch of compute. Um, Big Fish doesn't have the issue of the agent really ever wasting compute because there's no way for it to stagnate and like not interact with the environment. Obviously, the platformer games have this property where like if you don't have a reasonably short timeout, then they, it really can stagnate a bit more, and so the timeout helps ensure that you're just like covering more and more levels. Um, so that, yeah, that's roughly what we what we like, you know. How, how we, I mean, it is, it is definitely an important choice in practice. Like, if you if you were to give Coin Run, you know, an arbitrary, I mean, I don't know how it would break down for every single environment, but if you if you choose like very poor timeouts or like don't have a timeout at all, it definitely like hurts training a lot. So we pretty much just chose the timeouts to like you know make sure. That the agent trains. Sweet. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. All right, I guess now I have strict instructions that we will have to uh, end this webinar soon, but the discussions can continue on the forums and on Discord. Uh, we have been trying to gather a lot more people on Discord where uh, there can be a lot more fluid communication between all of you. We are there to help you in any way we can. Uh, we also want to uh, basically start uh, an office hour of sorts, which will be uh, one or two hours every week where we'll be available on a Zoom call where you can just come in and ask any questions. If you have any trouble making a submission, we'll be there to help you, so on and so forth. And uh, we invite you to come join us on uh, this Discord channel for ProcGen where we can take the rest of the conversation. Now, we will reach out to you uh, with the credits that we have from AWS to pass on to you guys. And uh, we will hopefully see you again in about a month and a half in the next webinar when we are uh, uh, you know, wrapping up uh, the competition and whatnot. And another important bit is, uh, given that we are doing it as a part of this open research initiative and we want to engage a lot more part, a lot more of you in the, the research, we will be looking forward to kind of have some of you who are the top participants in the comp competitions uh, uh, be co-authors in the final paper that we write describing this whole benchmark and the uh, results around it. And hopefully this sets the tone for many such benchmarks uh, to uh, kind of come up. Same for uh, many other uh, research efforts that we have. We are always looking for research fellows to come uh, uh, join the community with their interesting projects or join others who are initiating new interesting research projects. 
So thank you so much. I uh, hope to uh, see you all soon, both in Discord and uh, Discourse. Ich muss aber genauso viel ausgeben, wie ich das jetzt sagen wollte.